Hello, everyone. This is Frank with Teachling University, and we're going to be discussing this lecture today, how to flow into prosperity. And I've talked about flow in several lectures, and I've dedicated a few entire lectures on the, the mindset and process of flow, and I'll attach that uh, lecture to this video. But really, when it comes to flow, it's a frame of mind, and it's a mindset that where we're totally immersed in the present moment. And when you think about many of the decisions that we make on a daily basis, we make these decisions based on the experiences of the past. And we base these decisions also on self-limiting beliefs, perhaps about our ability to develop relationships, to earn money, or perhaps other limiting beliefs that really hold us back and prevent us from really building a reality that is much more desirable in building a vision of a better future. Because we're operating on a state of survival where we're all, where the decisions that we make or the actions that we take in the direction of what we want is based on the feelings of lack and scarcity and anxiety and fear. But what I'm suggesting in this lecture today is that by entering states of flow, where we are immersed in the present moment, we're not trying to force an outcome but rather, we follow our instincts in our intuition. We are no longer at bay of our current circumstances or from specific events that happen in our lives because we're controlling our focus and controlling our stream of consciousness. When we focus more on the higher mental faculties and the powers within us to live a better life. So I want to quote Joe Dispenza. We're going to be discussing Joe Dispenza and Stephen Kotler in this lecture and some of their insights on this subject. Joe Dispenza says that to be happy with yourself in the present moment while maintaining a dream of your future is a grand recipe for manifestation. When you feel so whole that you no longer care whether it will happen, that's when amazing things materialize before your eyes. I've learned that being whole is the perfect state of creation. I've seen this time and time again and witnessing true healings in people all over the world. They feel so complete that they no longer want, no longer feel lack, and no longer try to do it themselves. They let go. And to their amazement, something greater than, than they are responds, and they laugh at the simplicity of the process. What struck at me with this quote from Dispenza is towards the end of it, where he says that they let go. And to their amazement, something greater than they are responds. So often we think that we are solely responsible for whatever events or desirable circumstances happen in our lives. And certainly we do take responsibility for what happens. But there are also forces outside of us that are greater than we are. You can call it God, the universe, infinite intelligence, energy, whatever you want to call it. Creative forces that are responsible for the known universe and for our own reality in the world that we live in. And by tapping into this force, this energy, this intelligence, where something greater than us responds. And we can only tap into this energy, this intelligence, when we are in the present moment. We we're no longer trying to force an outcome because we no longer yearn or are under the mindset of lack or scarcity. We are whole and complete. And when we're in the present moment, we also become self-aware of this force that is also within us. We become aware, aware of it, and we impress upon it what it is that we desire. Where we live in the end, as Neville says, where we act and feel as if there are prayers have already been answered. When we operate this way and we act on our instincts and listen to our intuition, self-doubt, frustration, indecision, fear seems to fade away because now we are trusting into this force, this force within us, where the decisions that we make are aligned with what it is that we truly want. And when we're in this state, when we're in the present moment, where challenge meets skill, where the, we, the actions that we take then don't create any sort of strife. And we're in that zone where we are acknowledging that creation is done. That's when things begin to happen. And that's when our uh, future, our more desirable future for that matter, seems to unfold in front of our eyes. 
So simply just taking action in and of itself is not enough. How often have we taken action, stayed busy, worked really hard, but got nowhere closer to where we want to be? It's when we finally let go and just surrender to this process when all of a sudden what we really want just appear to show up in our lives without a, take, for us taking much effort. So it is surrendering and letting go to a greater mind, into a greater power. So Dispenza says then that most change starts with a simple process of something outside of us altering something inside of us. If you begin the inward journey and start to change your inner, inner world of thoughts and feelings, it should create an improved state of well-being. If you keep repeating the process of meditation, then in time, epigenetic changes should begin to alter your outer presentation. You become your own placebo. So to heal the wounds of self-limiting beliefs and negative thoughts and behaviors and ideas. We must then, at least through meditation and through periods of time, disconnect ourselves from our world, from our external environment, and go within. And go on the inward journey towards peace and prosperity and abundance and so forth. And doing so, once again, requires that we follow our intuition. And there's a lot of noise out there, a lot of opinions regarding, you know, especially in the personal growth space, on how to live your life and how to achieve a particular goal. It is not to say that none of these opinions matter. I think that certainly there's a lot of great information out there. And hopefully you're finding some great information in my lectures. But ultimately, where it all starts is following your own intuition and your own instincts and what it is that you really want. And sometimes the best decision to make or action to take is not taking any action at all. It is to assume the wish fulfilled, to assume that what you want or is already yours, and then just let go about your day and live your life. And stop trying to force an outcome. By embodying and becoming what you want and what you want to see in your life, you become your own placebo because you begin to heal yourself from the wounds of the past. Since we are no longer operating based on the memories of the past, because we are now in the present moment and working towards building a better future, where the most desirable future is already in the present moment, where creation is already done. And when we inhabit this mindset, then we are no longer held at bay or enslaved from this, our external circumstances. Where no matter what our circumstances may be within our own mental studio, within our own imagination, we visualize and see what it is that we want and consider it already done. This is incredibly empowering and I think also a simple but powerful technique to master. It isn't necessarily easy at first because obviously we are trained to rely solely on our senses to navigate through this world. But just because you can't see something just doesn't mean that it's not possible. And some of the greatest gifts and greatest powers that we can ever obtain cannot be seen with a naked eye and cannot be seen with our senses. It is intangible. It is something within us. It is a force that once you surrender to, to this greater mind, it will help you see things and experience new possibilities and relationships and opportunities that can propel you to a new and more loving and happier existence. So the Spencer says that, so your thoughts drive then your feelings. And your feelings drive your thoughts, and eventually this loop hardwires your brain into the same patterns which conditions your body into the past. And because emotions are a record of, the, of past experiences, if you can't think greater than how you feel, this thinking-feeling loop keeps you anchored to your past and creates a constant state of being. This is how the body becomes the mind, or in time, how your thoughts run you and your feelings own you. So how we allow negative feelings and let negative mental states to own us is when we try to suppress them or fight them. If we do experience frustration and anxiety and fear, we try to suppress it or, or try to, to banish it from our mind. But by doing this, by trying to use force in ridding ourselves of these self-limiting beliefs and feelings, we actually give them more energy and power and they become entrenched into our consciousness and into our minds. So then to overcome these negative feelings, then it requires that we accept them for what they are. If you're experiencing fear, frustration, and even anger, that's okay. Accept it. And ask yourself, well, why am I feeling this way? 
And when you ask yourself that question, you'll discover the answer as to why. And chances are it's because there are certain needs that are not being met in your life, whether from relationships, your career, health goals, or desires, and so forth. There are certain physical and psychological needs that need to be met or need to be satisfied in order for us to have a, a very good quality of life. So to think greater than we feel, then, is to acknowledge and accept negative emotions, while at the same time, then, embracing and cultivating new, more empowering mental states, one of them, of course, being in states of flow, when we're in the present moment, when we're acting out on our instincts. And I think when you act out on our instincts, this is often an overlooked skill or really way of looking at ourselves and the world around us. We tend to look outside of ourselves, listening to various opinions, but we never bother to look within ourselves and look at this greater power within us that we should surrender to and listen to. And when we acknowledge that creation is done, that once we assume the wish fulfilled then the work is already done, then just a matter of time, life will reveal itself to you where what you want shows up without much effort or strain. Or frustration. And that is really one of the greater ways then to overcome the feelings or negative feelings that we may experience. And to then help us then make the right decisions in the direction of where we want to go. It's listening to our intuition, our intuition being a certain feeling. If we feel empowered to take action in a certain direction, maybe it's to make a phone call or send an email or make a decision to uh, apply to a particular school or program or job, we should listen to that intuition. And if our intuition tells us not to take any sort of action in the immediate moment, then we should do that as well. But it's using our feelings as leverage to help propel us to a brighter future. When we overcome these negative states and feelings, by accepting them for what they are, and that they are all part of the process of personal transformation. So to quote Stephen Collar from his book, The Rise of Superman, he says a sense flow is a fluid state, act, action state, excuse me. Making better decisions isn't enough. We also have to act out on those decisions. The problem is fear, which stands between us and all actions. Yet our fears are grounded in self, time, and space. With our sense of self out of the way, we are liberated from doubt and insecurity. With time gone, there is no yesterday to regret or tomorrow to worry about. And when our sense of space disappears, so do physical consequences. But when all three vanish at once, something far more incredible occurs, our fear of death. That most fundamental of all fears can no longer exist. Simply put, if you're infinite and intemporal, you cannot die. I love this quote from Collar, and I've used it in several of my lectures. I think it's extremely powerful for several reasons, which we're going to get into. Let's look at the beginning of this quote, where he says that since flow is a fluid action state, making better decisions isn't enough. We also have to act out on those decisions. Remember what I call in the past few lectures or slides about acting out on our instincts. When we act out on our instincts, we experience less resistance. What creates burnout and frustration and indecision or indecisiveness is when we don't listen to our instincts, we simply act out on what everyone else expects us to do. Or we act out on the suggestions from others, from perhaps social media, from what our friends and family, coworkers, or other people tell us how we should live our lives. And it is these suggestions outside of us that creates the, the most amount of frustration and even resentment because we're following the advice from others who supposedly have good intentions for us. But really deep down, these suggestions, in fact, do the opposite. They go against our own self-interest. So to enter states of flow, we must not only make decisions, but make decisions based on our own instincts. Now, I'm not saying that we should listen to every single instinct single instinct that we do have. We do have to take some time to think through our decisions. But when the decision that we make will, is, will empower us, will help us move us forward, and is good for us, we should act out on those decisions and not take or waste too much time in making that decision. Even if the decision isn't necessarily the right one, the fact that you made that decision and is congruent with your own beliefs 
and congruent with what it is that you want, that is, you, you experience a sense of euphoria because you begin the process of taking control of your life. And more importantly, you begin to enter these states of flow where you don't second guess your decision, you just act. And there are chemicals that are released in the brain when we enter these states of flow like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and other feel-good chemicals that when you act out on these decisions where challenge meets skill, magic seems to happen. And also another thing that Collar alludes to, he, it, it reminds me of in Maxwell Maltz's book in Psycho-Cybernetics, where we no longer feel overly self-conscious. We're not worried about our self-image or our, our self-limiting beliefs about ourselves seem to vanish. We're not worried about what other people think. Again, what it goes back to what I was saying. We're not following the suggestions of others rather than we're listening to our own instincts. And when we act out on these instincts, then over time, this will propel us towards a specific goal that we desire. And this could be scary. That's where the fear comes in. Because when we act on our, on our intuition, we enter the unknown. Because we're no longer relying on our external circumstances or relying on the suggestions of others as a crutch towards how we think. Rather, we are relying on our own intuition, our own feelings, our own thought processes and following our heart towards our dreams. And when we do this, when we no longer are self-conscious, we're not worried about what other people think, we act down our own decisions. We make the decisions and aren't worried about what the people think. When this indecisiveness fades away, then so does these other negative feelings, such as frustration and anxiety and indecisiveness. But then as Collar says, then this fear of death seems to disappear. Because when we're in the present moment, we are at the apex of human existence. As Abraham Maslow says in his hierarchy of needs, the pinnacle of that hierarchy or the top of that pyramid is when we are authentically expressing ourselves by acting out on our instincts. And when we do that, we feel invincible. And a lot of athletes, as Stephen Collar interviewed, these high-performing athletes like surfers and skydivers and cave divers and so forth, in interviewing them, he found that many of these athletes love getting in these states of flow and were, really, were willing to, to risk serious injury, even death. Because when they performed these uh, death-defying stunts, they were in this moment of flow where they felt godlike or invincible. Now, I'm not saying you have to be a high-level athlete to enter these states. Quite, quite the contrary. You could enter these states of flow at a moment's notice by making a decision, by taking some calculated risks and making decisions without the concern of what other people think. So Collar says that flow is more than an optimal state of consciousness, one where we feel our best and perform our best. It also appears to be the only practical answer to the question, what is the meaning of life? Flow is what makes life worth living. So as I said before in Collar's quote, where the fear of death seems to disappear when we enter these states. Why? Because as Collar says uh, in this quote, that when we enter these states of flow, we are really discover the meaning of life which is that we are authentically expressing ourselves creatively. We're living our best life. We're being who we truly are and aren't concerned with the distractions and suggestions outside of us. So then from a quality of life perspective, psychologists have found that the people who have the most flow in their lives are the happiest people on earth. Why is that? Well, that's the case because these individuals, these folks who are in flow more often, have found meaning and purpose in their life. The meaning being living a life in flow or engaging in work that is creative, that is meaningful, that helps others and helps them put themselves in this state much more often. So when it comes to work and a career, it is important then that we choose a profession that helps us put in this state much more often. And one of the reasons why I love making these lectures, for example, is that it helps put me in the state of flow. I feel totally immersed in what it is that I'm doing. I'm in the zone when I make these lectures, which is why it's so enjoyable. And I hope that you're enjoying these lectures as well. 
So that's something you want to consider when choosing a profession. And that is we want to be entering these states of flow or put or to put it another way. We want to make flow a priority in our life. When we make flow a priority. And we get into states of flow more often. Magic seems to happen where life or the universe smiles itself upon you, where suddenly new insights, new revelations, new relationships, opportunities, experiences that can propel your career, your relationships, your personal life, your health, etc. Because you're getting yourself out of your own way and you're unleashing the energy of the universe that has been bottled up within you for quite some time. And when that happens, all of a sudden you no longer feel tired, you don't feel frustrated, you're in this zone. So Collar says, I didn't come from a religious background. Growing up, everything was proof-driven. If you couldn't see it, couldn't experience it, it didn't exist. But I've had experiences that bitch slapped me out of this lower order mentality. My need for proof, I've been given it now. If you want to tell me that God doesn't exist, well, now you have to prove that to me. So this goes back to what I was saying that just because you can't see something doesn't mean it is not po uh, possible. And the most endearing and the most rewarding of gifts and the most powerful forces that are out there are intangible. You can't see them, but they're there. They're within you. And when you acknowledge this and become aware of it and communicate with your higher self in this intelligence and follow it and listen to it, you create this congruency where mind and body are one. You're whole and complete because once you've discovered this higher self, you discover the ultimate form of self-expression, which is all that we're really after. The reason why we want to achieve particular goals is because of how it makes us feel. And more importantly, it makes us feel that we are authentically expressing ourselves, which is all that we really desire. We want to be who we really are. And when we achieve this, then life becomes much more meaningful and enjoyable. And it becomes this grand adventure where anything seems possible. So scientists who study human motivation, Carlos states, I've lately learned that after basic survival needs have been met, the combination of autonomy, the desire to direct your own life, mastery, the desire to learn, explore, and be creative, and purpose, the desire to matter, to contribute to the world, are our most powerful intrinsic drivers. The three things that motivate us most, all three are deeply woven through the fabric of flow. One of the reasons that we've seen, I believe, in the, in the great resignation, why so many people have seen to leave their jobs is because ultimately they're yearning this experience. They want to have jobs and careers that provide them this autonomy and this ability to be creative, to express themselves where they can learn, explore and be creative and ultimately to matter and make a difference. And I think that corporate America and many businesses as a whole should really seriously consider this when hiring their employees and creating their culture or their cultural corporate environment to create an environment where their employees have this ability to acquire mastery and autonomy and to learn, explore and be creative and then where they can make a difference. But when we seek states of flow and we enter these states of flow, we're not so much concerned with the outcome of the end result, but the process itself, the process to learn, to explore, to create, and to direct our own life. And when we act out on our instincts, even if we don't necessarily get a desired result right away, by acting out on our instincts, we enter these states of flow. Because one of the ingredients of flow is the, is the ability or when we are able to direct your own life. When you make decisions based on your instincts and what you want and say no to what you don't want, you begin to take control of your own life and your own destiny. And that takes courage. By acting out on your instincts, you may see that certain jobs that you've held or relationships seem to fade away. And it may be scary at first because there could be some major disruptions in your life. But once you then make these decisions, coming out of the other side of it is a whole new world of possibility. So finally, to quote Kotler, he says that what all this means is that learning the impossible is possible augments our ability to see ourselves doing the impossible, which triggers a system, systemic change in the body and the brain, which closes the gap between fantasy and reality, 
and also makes us significantly more flow prone. So when we enter states of flow, and I said this, that what creates so much strife and frustration and anxiety is the gap between where we are and where we want to be, where we want to be being a particular goal or circumstance or desirable life. But when we enter states of flow, we bridge that gap and we merge from where we are to where we want to be as one. Or to put it another way, we bring the future into the present moment where what we want is already here. Creation is already complete. And what becomes impossible suddenly now becomes a real possibility. And when that happens, life becomes so much more exciting. And that gives you the juice and the motivation then to take desired action in the direction of where you want to go. And this is a very important point. Flow carries with it, within it, delicious possibility in the state we are aligned with our core passion and because of flow's incredible impact and performance, expressing that passion to our utmost. Again, expressing that passion, expressing our authentic selves, acting out on our instincts. And in under normal conditions, playing chess, writing a report, this is empowering. So we can use then these mental faculties that we have, these higher mental faculties that Bob Proctor, who I've referenced, that by using them and acknowledging them and becoming aware of them and surrendering to this force and this power and this intelligence, we align ourselves with incredible forces that combine with our passion can make the impossible possible. And that's really rewarding. And I can't tell you, I mean, to say that it's empowering is an understatement. Because this really changes everything. Once we believe this and utilize this uh, way of thinking, suddenly then the problems that we have been plaguing us for so long seem to fade away. We outgrow our problems. So to quote Mihaly Simmons and Hiley from his book, Flow, he says that on the job, people feel skillful and challenged and therefore feel more happy, strong, creative, and satisfied. In their free time, people feel that there is generally not much to do and their skills are not being used. And therefore, they tend to feel more sad, weak, and dull and dissatisfied. You know, yet they'll like to work less and spend more time in leisure. So what we find is that in states of flow. Now, I kind of differ from Mihaly a little bit here, but to enter states of flow, it's not solely when we're resting, but it's when challenge meets skill. And we engage in work or projects that excite us and challenge us. And when we experience this challenge and overcome it, while overcoming our own self-limiting beliefs, that's when we enter the sweet present moment. And this, of course, can seem a contradiction where, in fact, we enter these states of bliss and flow more often when we're working than when we're resting. resting. This can sound contradictory. But there are several possible explanations, as Mahaley says. But one conclusion seems inevitable. When it comes to work, people do not heed the evidence of their senses. They disregard the quality of immediate experience and base their motivation instead on the strongly rooted cultural stereotype of what work is supposed to be like. They think of it as an imposition of constraint and infringement of their freedom, and therefore something to be avoided as much as possible. So we enter these states of flow when we're working because we're no longer then concerned about the outcome which is not really what's motivating us. We're, to put it another way, as Mahaley says, we're now relying on our senses. Again, what are we relying on? Our instincts. When we rely on our instincts and make decisions and act out on our instincts and get this decision mu muscle to the point where it's strong and that we, we're not afraid or unafraid to make decisions on a consistent basis, absent the suggestions outside of us, then that's when work becomes much more fulfilling. And then we get to see the world as filled with possibilities and that we can achieve prosperity at a moment's notice. Once we make the decision and recognize this power within us, that if we communicate with it, we can begin then seeing the magic of the present moment and the magic within our lives. Thank you for watching this video. I, think, I want to thank all my subscribers for subscribing to my YouTube channel and look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.